Hi everyone. Uh, I'd like to apologize for those who weren't able to access my video earlier. Some of the images I had triggered the copyright and it was taken down from YouTube. I removed the images, but I haven't changed the audio otherwise. So just be prepared for some times where what I'm saying doesn't exactly match the video. Anyways, thanks again for the students who let me know about this. And without further ado, let me tell you all about single electron avalanche shadows. One of the most important aspects of quantum physics is measurement. Unlike in classical physics, the thing we are measuring don't behave in the way we expect them to. Even more, quantum mechanics deals in the nanoscale. And this one such thing is a photon, which not only behaves as both a particle and a wave, but travels at the speed of light. Luckily, we have a technology that can measure these things, known as a photodiode. These sensors rely on the photoelectric effect to generate an electric signal when incident photons are detected. What's happening here is a result of photons striking electrons in the photodiode material and ejecting them from the atoms. The structure of the photodiode is actually fairly simple, requiring not much more than a silicon semiconductor that has been doped on both sides to form what we call a PN junction. The anode of the diode has been diffused with an element that can bond with silicon to form valency holes, um, which we call the positive or P side. And the cathode has been doped with an element that bonds with silicon to create excess electrons in the outer shells, which is the negative or N side. While both sides are highly conductive, the junction between them can quickly become depleted of charge carriers and up non-conductive, resulting in depletion region and no natural current flow. However, when light hits this depletion region, an electron hole pair is created from the photoelectric effect, and the holes move to the anode while the electrodes move to the cathode. With enough light, a photocurrent is generated and can be detected. While photodiodes are great for measuring large amounts of light, in the end they are not too useful for more precise quantum measurements and experiments. What we want instead is a photon that can generate a detectable current with only a few photons. One thing we could do is utilize impact ionization, by which a free electron with enough kinetic energy can knock another electron from its bound state, creating an electron whole pair. If this first free electron came from the photoelectric effect, and the one generated by the impact ionization goes on to create even another one, and then another one after that, then that initial photon can end up generating a much larger photocurrent than its initial energy would have otherwise. However, there still isn't enough to really cut down the amount of photons necessary for detection. Instead, a region of high electrical field in the photodiode can result in what we call an avalanche breakdown which means the free electrons generated by this impact ionization get accelerated even further. And so we end up with a gain, which is close to 100 for each photon. Because of this, because of this, we call these avalanche photodiodes. <clears throat> because of this, we call these avalanche photodiodes, which require electric fields generated with very high reverse voltages in the range of five to 10 volts. Because of this, we call these avalanche photodiodes, which require electric fields generated with very high reverse voltages in the range of 5 to 10 volts, much larger than the ones in photodiodes. Because of this, we call these avalanche photodiodes, which require electric fields generated with a very high reverse voltage in the range of 5 to 10 volts much larger than the ones in normal photodiodes. Now that we have a way to detect low numbers of photons, what about a single photon? These type of detectors would be incredibly useful for high accuracy experiments that measure the characteristics of photons themselves or require us to use just a single photon. In this case, we can use the same avalanche breakdown principle, but increase the reverse voltage up to the hundreds of volts, exceeding the junction breakdown voltage. We call these diodes single photon avalanche diodes, or SPADs. Now, a single charge carrier injected into the depletion layer can trigger a self-sustaining avalanche that can only be stopped by lowering the bias voltage down to or below the breakdown voltage. Otherwise, it'll keep going. This avalanche produces a leading edge that can be measured and allows us to determine the arrival time of the original photon down to the picosecond through the use of special mathematics. This makes this an amazing technology for both low light or high temporal resolution applications. Photodiodes themselves have been dominant technology for detecting photons of light since they were invented. 
Then an investigation of the light detection properties of PN junctions were done in the 1940s by Russell Ohl, shown here. But scientists like Gooden and Pohl have been theorizing since the 1920s. And 10 years after Russell Ohl, in the 1950s, avalanche photodiodes were discovered by Japanese scientists. And finally, in the 1970s, spads were created. Even today, we're still adjusting and continuously creating better and better spads. Now, spads are a state of the art for photon detection, but we still don't use them everywhere. This is because they can not only be too sensitive to light, but they are also not as simple as the previous technologies. Since the avalanche has to be quenched, it takes time to reset the detector and requires high level math to determine the timing of that quench and the timing of the leading edge of the avalanche. Furthermore, they require much more precise manufacturing, requiring massive voltage applied, which makes them more fragile. And unless the timing and single photon detection is paramount, using basic photo detectors are generally the way to go. But with bads, we can utilize many different technologies. One of such is LIDAR, a form of 3D laser scanning that stands for laser imaging, detection, and ranging. LIDAR is commonly used to make high resolution maps with applications ranging from surveying to autonomous car navigation. The systems use pulse lasers to map a three-dimensional model of an environment. And LiDAR's use of light allows it to map the environment quickly and more accurately than systems that use sound, like sonar, or microwave, like radar. LiDARs map out by sending laser pulses, and when the pulse contacts an object or obstacle, it reflects and bounces back to the LiDAR unit, which contains a SPAD sensor. The system then receives the pulse and calculates the distance between it and the object based on the elapsed time. And that SPADs are highly accurate at measuring this elapsed time. LiDAR does this rapidly, with some emitting millions of pulses per second. As the beams return to the system, it begins forming a picture of what's going on in the world around the vehicle and can use computer algorithms to piece together shapes for the cars, people, and other obstacles. Without SPAD, LiDAR would not be able to create these real time maps of the world. Another use is the time of flight principle which is a method for measuring the distance between a sensor and an object, which is kind of what we're doing in LiDAR. Based on the time difference between the emission of a signal and its return to the sensor after it's being reflected by an object, it is important only to use one signal. So a single photon detector works perfectly here. Compare. Now, this use is really taking advantage of the time of flight principle, which is a method for measuring the distance between a sensor and an object based on the time difference between the emission of a signal and its return to the sensor after being reflected. It is important to only use one signal, and so it's a single photon is the only way this works here. And a single photon detector is what's great. So compared to ultrasound, it provides far greater range faster readings and greater accuracy while still maintaining the small size, low weight, and low power consumption characteristics. Now, bad systems are constrained by their size. Like many other semiconductor applications, we have reached a bottleneck in our ability to reduce this size. So future improvements will be more based on efficiency and being able to detect more individual photons in a given time frame, like our application for LiDAR. We currently need to test millions and millions at a single every second. The temporal resolution is at its peak right now for light, uh, for bad systems, and we can't really go any less than a single photon. So accuracy and efficiency improvements are the focus of future research. And that's it. Thank you so much, everyone, for listening to my video on single photon avalanche diodes. I hope you learned a lot about them and you can see all the amazing applications these have for the future from everything for quantum measurements to autonomous vehicles and LiDAR systems. Hope you all have a good one. Thank you.